So today our speaker is Almog, Dr. Almog Yelenevich, an astrophysicist from the University of Toronto, and he'll be telling us all about black holes. Hi. So uh, thanks, Moni. Um, and um, one thing about this talk, I think the best way to go about it is I won't be able to monitor the um, uh, the chat window or anything while I'm talking. So um, if you want to ask a question, then um, Moni, just like that you uh, alert me whenever someone's has a question for me. And uh, even better if we reserve the questions till, to the end. Anyway, um, let's get started. So today I'm going to be talking about black holes. So I'm assuming that everyone here has heard about black holes, but uh, haven't learned about them properly. So what I want to do is um, I'm to shed some light on them. Um, and what, I'm, when I sh what I want to show in the end is summarized here in this uh, Yiddish um, sentence here, which means uh, the hole is not as dark as, as people paint it. So let's get started. So the lecture, the uh, plan of the uh, talk is as follows. So first I'm going to be talking about what black holes are not, because there are a lot of um, misconceptions about them propagated by uh, science fiction uh, movies and, and, and TV shows. Then I'm going to talk about what, what they are, a little bit about the life cycle out in the cosmos, and the ways that um, as astronomers uh, find them. So let's start by talking about what black holes are not. So um, they're not what they're made to be in most sci-fi series. So in, in most um, sci-fi movies, whenever the um, protagonists need to get somewhere or go back in time or something, they usually use a black hole. Now black holes, as far as we know, they're not time machines, they're not wormholes, they're not portals, you can't get to other places, you can't get to other dimensions. Um, and as far as we know, whatever in, is in, inside the black hole, the other side of the horizon, is whatever used to be there before the black hole collapsed gravitationally. Now, I will mention one reservation. So you see, I, when I wrote, there's no, there are no time machines, there is a small caveat. So one thing that does happen, and this is a completely physical effect, is that the time, time flows slower when you're close to a black hole. So uh, if you spend some time close to a black hole and then you emerge out of that, then you'll find that the rest of the world has, has moved much farther in time. Um, and this, but again, you can't, but you can't use, the, but this is different from being able to go to the past. So it just the time flows at different rates. And this is completely physical effect. And if you've seen Interstellar, this is uh, the effect that allows um, the protagonist, played by uh, Matthew McConaughey, to uh, stay young while his daughter uh, becomes older than, than, than he is. Uh, second thing about black holes is probably, even if you could travel to them, you, can't, you couldn't survive the plunge. And the reason for that is that most black holes have tidal forces. So if you're standing close to a black hole, the uh, gravitational force on your feet will be uh, higher than, than on your head. So the black hole will tend to rip you apart and, or, or anything that you throw into it. Um, this is, again, this is for most black holes. Um, but it turns out that this doesn't happen when the black hole is, is big enough. Um, so once it's above about 100 million so solar masses, so 100 million times the mass of the sun, then uh, the, the tal these tidal forces are weak enough that um, no matter can, can withstand them. Now this sounds like a, um, like a, a crazy big number, but actually we find, astronomers find black holes that are more massive than this. So this is not, this is not an unusually large black hole out in, out in the universe. Lastly, I wanna um, mention um, this idea. So about, I don't know if you remember, but about uh, 10 years ago, there was a, a new particle, well new at the time, particle collider that was built on the border of uh, Switzerland and France. And it was supposed to, it, it was the stronger, strongest one at the time. And one of the concerns was that it's going to produce tiny black holes and are going to destroy the earth. Um, now, the problem with this idea is that as far as we know, uh, there's a minimum mass on black holes. So black holes can't be lower than a certain mass. Now, this mass is of the order of micrograms, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's, an, but you need orders of magnitude more energy to produce it than what we have what, what is currently available. So uh, as far as we know, it, it can't produce uh, such a tiny black hole. Another problem with this idea is that black holes are not forever and they evaporate. Now this is not an issue for big ones, the ones that 
occur in astrophysics. And we'll talk about it a little bit about, about this later, but for, for smaller ones, they evaporate very fast. Um, and so, so even, if it, even if a black hole were produced, it's, it's not gonna last very long. And finally, there's an issue of the radio, radius of influence. So even if you did manage to produce a black hole, and if, and if you did manage to maintain it, the radius of influence is, is tiny. So for example, if, if you take a black hole with a mass of one ton and you throw it at someone else, it's only going to absorb the equivalent of one cell out of their body. So it's not gonna do a lot of damage. Right, so with that, uh, so now that we've, talk, we've talked about what black holes are, let's talk about what they are. So to qualify to become a black hole, you have to satisfy a very simple condition. You have to, uh, have, you have, to have an object where the escape velocity is higher than the speed of light. Now let's break down this, uh, this definition. So the sp speed of light is the, is the speed with which all uh, kinds of electromagnetic radiation propagates. So uh, we, we used to thinking about light, of regular light that's coming from the sun or from, from lamp, but also radio waves and X-ray, they're all part of the same spectrum. They're all part of the same kind of, um, they're all the same kind of, of, um, of wave. And they all travel at a huge velocity of about 300,000 kilometers per second. So here we have a demonstration that shows uh, how fast light goes. So this is the speed at which light goes around the earth. So it is, it is extremely fast. The next concept is the escape velocity. Now to understand the escape velocity, let's think about this experiment. So suppose I have this hill and on this hill I put a cannon and I fire bullets from the, from the cannon. Now, if I fire the, if the, um, if the velocity is slow, then the bullet lands close to the, to the cannon. If I increase the velocity, it lands further and further away. And at some point, if I fire it fast enough, then the curvature of the earth is gonna be important. So if I fire it fast enough, it's always going to fall towards the earth, but it's always gonna miss. And eventually, if you do it just, just right, then uh, at, a, at a certain critical velocity, it's not even gonna land anywhere on, on the earth. What it's gonna do is just go around and, um, and come back to the back of the cannon. And this is called the orbital velocity. Now, if you go, if you keep increasing the velocity, then um, you'll end up with um, elliptical trajectories, but beyond another, critical velocity, so about 40 times larger than this, than the orbital velocity, you get something called the escape velocity. And at this velocity, you'll fire something, but this thing will never come back to Earth. Now for Earth, it's about, the, the escape velocity is about 100, about, sorry, 11 kilometers per second for the sun, and is, um, it's, um, because the sun is much larger, it's about 300 kilometers per second, and, um, and this, re re this represents how, um, and this is a function of, of, of both the mass and the size of the object. So if the object is more massive, then the, the, then the escape velocity is gonna be higher. If it's larger, then the escape velocity is gonna be lower. Um, and in, in the, this idea with orbital velocity has already been mentioned in um, the Hitchhiker, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and um, so to understand the orbital velocity, it's, it's not that it stops, the object stops falling, but in a way it, it falls, but always misses the Earth. As was uh, described better than, than I can by uh, Douglas Adams here. Now in 1905, um, a very famous German Jewish um, physicist called Albert Einstein came up with this, the idea of relativity. And in a nutshell, the idea was that gravity was not like other forces. So when you think about other forces like magnetism, like electromagnetism, for example, you can think about it as, you can think about two objects that communicate between them by sending out particles. And this is how they, they affect each other. But with gravity, it's different. With gravity, the idea was that instead of um, communicating between two objects, what, what happens is that an object distorts space, space time around it. And another uh, idea in, in the same theory is, um, 
And the same theory also uh, assumes that um, the speed of light is the fastest velocity that anything can attain, not just light. Um, because without it, in print, if if you, if we didn't have um, if we didn't have this idea, then in principle you could say, well, maybe uh, maybe you have something where light can travel can't escape from, but maybe I can come up with another particle that's faster or that, that could escape it. But um, what Einstein's, Einstein's theory of relativity says is that if light can't escape, then nothing can escape. So if you have an object where the escape velocity is faster than the speed of light, it's not that just that light can't escape, nothing can escape it. Now, wh what happens when you get closer to a black hole? So first of all, from far away, black holes are not uh, I'll behave the same way as any other object. So um, any object like the sun or the moon, they all have gravitational field. And when you're far away from a black hole, this is all you'll, you'll experience. All, 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 all you, um, you'll, you'll, the, the only thing that, that you'll feel is attraction towards where the black hole is. But once you get close enough to a black hole, then things start getting uh, strange. So for example, and, and the closer you get, the stranger things become. So, first of all, when you think about, when you think about, uh, sorry. Oh, so Moni told me that there's, there's a problem. So you, you only see slide number 12? Moni, can you? Uh, yeah, can that's you correct. So you don't see when I go up and down? Nope. Oh. So okay. Okay. Let's let's so let me let's stop sharing. Let's see if I can share screen. I'm terribly sorry. Um, okay. Sorry about that. Let's see if I can get it to work now. Uh, okay, so can you see my screen now? Can you see me uh, changing the slides? Yes, now we can. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, yeah, so just to recap, um, this is what I've shown when I talked about how uh, black, holes, black holes can't take you to places. Um, this is what happens when you get too close, you get totally um, stretched. This is about uh, black holes destroying the Earth. Um, here's here's a demonstration of how fast um, light travels around the Earth. And this is this is about uh, Einstein and the theory of relativity. And this is slide number twelve. So, so okay. So this is this is where we stopped. Um, Right, so as I said, far from a black hole, you don't feel anything strange when you get close enough, then, um, then, you, start, uh, then you start noticing the difference. So um, first of all, um, there's the, this radius. So um, in the classical theory of, of, um, of satellites, satellites can, can orbit objects uh, at any radius. So for example, if you think about the Earth, about the sun, then it has, uh, satellites that are as close as Mercury and as far as, uh, as Neptune and, and Pluto. But for black holes, there's a critical radius below which you can't have uh, satellites moving on circular orbits. And this is this radius. So, this, so there's some critical radius called the ESCO. This is an acronym for innermost stable circular orbit. So if you try to get something to move on a circular orbit, it, it would just spiral inside. Now, if you move further in, then you get to another critical radius. Now, I should mention that even inside the, if you have an, um, a rocket or some, something that can propel itself, then in principle, you can have a spacesuit that moves in and out. This is not, this, you can still leave this radius. Now there's another critical radius uh, called the photonsphere. And if you're inside the photonsphere and you shine a light, the light will just move around and, and um, hit you in the back. So, so photons can be inside, can, can be inside this radius, and they can, they can leave, but uh, left to their own devices, they just go in circles. Now, if the black hole is spinning, 
There's also another region called the ergosphere, and in the ergosphere you can't you can't stay uh, stationary. So if you're outside, then in, in principle, if you have if you have uh, propulsion, then you can just hover. So you can sort of hover in place. But when you're inside the the ergosphere, then you can't. You're swept away with the um, with the spin of the of the black hole. And finally, there's this uh, radius called the Schwarzschild radius or the uh, event horizon. This is this is uh, classically the uh, point of of no return. So basically, so classically, if you cross this threshold, you can't come back. And to give you a sense of how big black holes are, if you take the sun and you squeeze it up to the point that it becomes a black hole it's going to be about the size of downtown Toronto, so about three kilometers. And in, in general, the radius of black holes is proportional to the mass. So if you make it bigger, then if you add more mass, it gets bigger and bigger. And the largest known black hole, that's about 10 billion solar masses, uh, it is about the size of the solar system. So they do, um, they do spend a huge range of sizes. Right, so the next topic is the um, life cycle of, of black holes. Um, so as far as we know, we've only found black holes in uh, of one of two kinds. So the first kind is stellar mass black holes. So this is between one and a hundred solar masses. So this is something that, is, uh, as far as we know, uh, used to be a star and then it collapsed and, and became a black hole. The other kind of black holes that we find are, are called supermassive black holes. Uh, so they're more than a million times more massive than the sun. And usually we find them in, um, in the centers of galaxies. And it's not clear if these things ever, ever, ever been stars at, at some point. Um, now in between, there is some sporadic evidence for um, what is known as the intermediate mass black hole. Um, but uh, it's, not, it's not conclusive. And there's, very, there's a lot of, um, whereas, Whereas there's a lot of uh, strong evidence for these two kinds, the, the third kind is very is very weak. But I should should mention it for completeness. Um, and the two the two masses of black holes that we find are not just it's not just a coincidence that uh, it's it's not that black holes can come in 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 also in all shapes and sizes and we just uh, cho chose some arbitrary points to divide them. As far as we know, there are two different mechanisms that generate them. So. Uh, for the stellar mass black holes, we think that they form in supernova explosions. So you start out with a very massive star, and this massive star explodes, and what's left behind is a compact object like, like a black hole. The other kind of, of supermassive black holes, we think, form in the centers of galaxies. And they, form in a very, and they also form in the very early universe. And when, when you have a galaxy forming, you have all these uh, very strong and violent currents and black holes, as you can see, as the black dots he dot here, um, they accrete, they absorb a lot of matter and grow. And it's not, and uh, this is something that's not fully understood, um, not as not as good as the uh, as the other kind, because um, we we have seen the birth of black holes in supernovae, but we haven't seen the birth of black holes of supermassive black holes inside galaxies. Now, once these black holes form, uh, they can actually grow. And they grow by, by absorbing more and more mass. And you, you can have two, there are two ways that they can get more mass. One way is just to merge with another black hole. So basically you, you somehow bring these two black holes together, they spiral into each other and merge to form a single black hole. Um, another way that they can grow is by accretion. And accre and Accretion means that they just, um, is that they absorb uh, microscopic objects, they absorb dust. Now this dust can't, um, for some physical, this dust usually can't just um, fall directly into the black hole. And what happens is that it forms these disks around them and it glows, it heats up as it spirals in and, and glows. And, usually, and it's usually easier to see uh, the, the, the emission that's coming from the secretion flows. Now, another um, effect about black holes that might be surprising is that uh, I said earlier that you can't get, uh, once something falls, usually you can't get it out, out of the black hole, but there is a way to, to extract energy from black holes. Um, 
usually if a black hole is spinning, as you can see in these simulations, then um, they can take magnetic fields and, and wind them. And as you can see in the simulation to the right. Now you can think about these magnetic fields as wires and all the, the charged particles behave like beads on these wires. So when you twist these wires, you accelerate the, uh, the particles up. And as they accelerate upwards, they take some of the energy back. So the, the black hole spins down and, and it sends out these, uh, these jets. And I'll show later on, I'll show some pictures of these jets exactly. Now, finally, the, it, it turns out that black holes, so maybe I should mention, for the longest time, it was told that black holes are eternal. So what's they form, the, they stay there. But in the 70s, uh, it was shown that actually this is not the case. And black holes, and actually, if, you, if uh, left to their own devices, and you wait an excru excruciatingly long time, then they eventually evaporate. And this was an insight that um, um, was due to um, the, the, the seminal works were, were by um, Stephen Hawking and by um, Yaakov Bekenstein from, from uh, the late Yaakov Bekenstein from the Hebrew University. And they showed that actually black holes um, behave like other objects and they emit, and, and they emit radiation and eventually they, um, and eventually, and eventually they, they disappear. Now, usually for, uh, for astrophysical black holes, or the ones that are observed in, out in nature, this time span is extremely long. It's orders of magnitude more than the age of the universe. So uh, it's not something that we have seen, uh, have seen happening. But um, we, we are confident about this process because there are lab experiments and I, if I have time, I'll, I'll say a bit more about them later. But there are lab experiments um, that were uh, led by um, William Unruh from, uh, from UBC that um, mimic some of the properties of black holes. So they're, they're called black hole analogs. And this radiation has been observed in these experiments. Now, before I move on, I also want to mention that um, another Canadian scientist who was instrumental to the um, work on evaporation of black holes is uh, Don Page from Alberta. Now, next I want to talk about how we find them, how, how astronomers find these black holes. Um, so there are different ways depending on the kind of black hole. So if you remember, I, I said that there are two kinds, there's the, lo the lower mass black holes and the high mass. And there are slightly different techniques for finding uh, either one of them. So, Maybe I should mention that the first uh, black hole ever detected is called uh, Cygnus X1. So Cygnus, Cygnus means the uh, constellation of stars, where it was found, and X1 just means that it's something that emits X-rays. And it was found by uh, um, it was found in 1964 by uh, by an X-ray satellite. So um, imagine um, so it's something. It, you know, X-ray satellites are something that um, the only reason it was only detected in, in the 60s and not earlier was that X-rays are very hard. You can't observe X-rays directly from Earth. You have to get outside the atmosphere. Uh, and, this is where, and this is the reason the, that black holes were only detect detected uh, uh, relatively recently. And after this, um, after this detection, there were uh, many more detections of the same kind. And um, and all of these, and, and it turns out that Cygnus X1 was only uh, was only one member of a, a much of a much larger family of X-ray binaries. And what happens here, and the only reason that something can be seen in the first place, because right, black holes are are black, and uh, and the sky is also black, so usually you can't see them by their own. The only reason that we can see something in the first place is that all these X-ray binaries are systems where you have a black hole, and right next to it, there's there's another star. And what the black hole does is, is that it steals material from the star and absorbs it. But the material just doesn't just fall straight into the black hole. It, it goes into this disk, and as it moves closer and closer to the black hole, it has to get rid of it. It gets squeezed, gets heated up, and actually it gets heated up so much to millions of degrees. And so, and, and it emits x-rays. 
and um, these and the, so the also another another interesting thing about these systems is that they're not uh, they're not steady they're not uh, they're not calm they have uh, they're very they're very dynamic they can emit uh, they they can flare they can they can release a huge amount of energy so for example uh, in the figure to the right what we see so in in this in the very center there's an X-ray binary again a star and a and a black hole uh, where the star is transferring mass to the black hole and these rings are light echoes. So um, a few tens or hundreds of years ago, there was some sort of a flare from the, from the system. And what we see here is the, the, the light from that flare reflected from, um, from the interstellar matter and, and scattered onto us. And you can see at least three um, consecutive events where this has happened. Now these systems, um, um, among other things, one, one of the um, researchers who, um, who studies these objects is Lorne Nelson from, um, from Bishop University here in Ontario. Now, another one, so um, the X-ray binaries that I mentioned are a system where the black hole and the uh, star are close enough that the black hole can, can steal material from the star. But there's also a way to detect binaries where this doesn't happen, where they're further enough that there's no mesh transfer. So these are called detached binaries. And essentially there are two ways to, uh, to detect them. So again, imagine that you have a system where uh, you have a, one, one of these balls is a black hole, the other one is a star. It's not terribly important which, which, which is which, but you can see when they uh, orbit each other, you get two effects. So first of all, um, you see that the star is moving in a circle, if it's viewed uh, face on, and if you if you view it from a, from a different different angle, then uh, you see, and you see it moving uh, to the left and to the right. Uh, so one way of detecting black holes is observing stars, uh, noting the location of stars uh, with very high accuracy, and just noting that they move back and forth uh, as though they're orbiting something, but you can't see what it is that they're orbiting. And if um, and if you do it long enough, then you can also um, you can also infer the mass of the object. And if the object is massive enough, then basically by elimination, you can say, well, it can't be anything else because something is so massive. Um, if a star would have been so massive, we would have seen it. So if you see a star moving uh, in a strange way, you can infer there's uh, a, an unseen companion. Now, another way to find these objects, another, another um, consequence of this motion is that the spectrum changes. So you can see here an example of how a spectrum changes when you, um, when due to this motion. Uh, so again, a spectrum is when you take uh, you take the light coming from the star and you separate it into the different colors. Now, because of an effect called called a Doppler effect, when this thing moves, this spectrum shifts. So if you note the spectrum at different time, you can find you can see that there's this motion motion along the line of sight. So it's so the the object is moving um, towards and away from us. So these are the two techniques that allow us to um, infer the existence of a black hole around around a star. Now, another way to find black holes is through an effect called gravitational lensing. So you can see in the diagram here what lensing does. So imagine that we are out here and we're observing the, the, the star, and all of a sudden there's a black hole that's coming in and and um, uh, intersects the line of sight. So it, it comes in between. Uh, us and, and the star. So one of the effects of general relativity is, the, is that light bends because of gravity. So previously all these rays would not have come to us, but because the black hole is here, then some of the rays that previously didn't get to us do get to us. So when the black hole gets in between us and the star, then the star becomes momentarily slightly brighter. And you can see an example for such an observation to the left see that there's a star here in the center and um, at some at some arbitrary time it's dim and um, when and, and when there was this um, uh, lensing event it got slightly brighter and um, there's and I should also mention that um, stars do get bright for for um, many reasons but 
uh, when there's a lensing, then they get bright and dim in a very particular way, which allows us to uh, to identify that this is indeed a lensing event and not just uh, some not, not just some flare on the star or some other process. Now, finally, uh, another way to find so maybe I should say um, all the all the methods described up to this point rely on light, different kinds of light, maybe visible light, maybe uh, actually, but they're all kind. They're all the same kind of electromagnetic radiation. Um, the method that I'm about to describe relies on a different kind of wave. So these are gravitational waves. And what happens is when you have black holes that are orbiting each other, then they send out these gravitational waves. So these are fluctuations in space time. And these fluctuations are can be um, can can now be observed. I'll talk a little bit about exactly how uh, these are observed. And they give rise to a very uh, unique, uh, whenever there's a, this in spiral, I don't know if you can hear this, but it gives rise to a very, um, to a very unique kind of signal called a chirp. So it's something that uh, starts out uh, dim and uh, so quiet and, and uh, at low frequency and ends up, ends up um, loud and, uh, and at a, at a high pitch, so it's something like Now, how do we measure these uh, gravitational waves? So to measure these gravitational waves, um, you need um, gravitational waves observatory. And the first one built was called LIGO. And the way that it works is that you have this facility out here and they have two arms, um, one, one stretching to the left and one stretching uh, up. And in each one of them, there's a, there's a laser that goes back and forth, back and forth. And what LIGO does all the time is compare the length of this arm to this arm. So with a the laser, there are tricks that you can use to measure lengths very accurately. Um, and basically you fold, you can fold the, the, the ray, you can let it pass back and forth multiple times and get higher precision this way. And when a gravitational wave passes through, then it changes the, the, the ratio between the lengths of these two. And um, you, the, the trick here is being able to measure distances at a very, um, very precisely and very fast. And to the left here are examples, in, the blue ones are examples of uh, the kinds of the, the first black holes that were found in this way. And the reason that it's drawn in this way is that uh, usually what, what's seen, what is seen is two black holes. So you always see two black holes that merge and form one more massive black hole. And below them, just for comparison, uh, they've also drawn, drawn the uh, inferred masses for black holes that are seen in other ways, for example, in X-ray binaries. Okay, so um, moving on next to the last kind of black hole, of uh, black holes that are detected, uh, the supermassive black holes. Uh, so first of all, the, the, the way that these were identified is um, actually just by, by looking at, um, at galaxies. So if you look at some galaxies, especially in the very early universe, you see these features. So you see jets coming out from the center. Uh, now this comes back to what we've talked about uh, earlier about uh, extracting black holes from, uh, ex extracting energy from black holes. So um, if you have a black hole at the, at the center that's accreting a lot of mass and launching these jets, then this could explain what, what is seen in both these pictures. So again, this is very, and this is very conspicuous and, and the same pattern repeats in countless other galaxies where you see um, powerful jets coming um, uh, from the center of the galaxy, where usually the, the supermassive black holes are. Now, even if there are, um, so again, th these are called uh, active galactic nuclei, they're somewhat common in the early universe, but kind of rare um, where we are in the late universe. But even inactive uh, galactic centers can be activated for a short period of time by something called a tidal disruption event. So you can see here in, the, um, in this video, uh, there's gonna be a, a tiny star that's coming in from, um, it's moving, it, it's on, it, at the top, moving to the left, and at the top left corner, there's a black hole and the star goes around the black hole 
and gets tightly disrupted. And then it spreads out and basically um, it, it gets divided into two, into two halves. So one half is moving away from the black hole at, at a huge velocity and the other half is forming some sort of a disk around it and ends up being, um, being eaten by the black hole. So this can give rise to a very bright transient, a very uh, bright um, new source of light in the sky. And it has a very unique signature, so it can be you can tell it apart from from other from from similar similar events, and you can understand what happens if you th again if you think about when uh, when you get too close to the black hole, then the forces on one end of the star are stronger than the forces on the other end, and this effectively uh, acts to tear the, the star apart. Um, and this is evidence for uh, the existence of black holes even in in galaxies that are too dim when you can't see the, uh, the jets. Now, around the, around the Milky Way, there's also another way. There's also a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. But this is, uh, the evidence for, for this black hole is um, different from the, from the other method. And this is because the, the black hole is so close, we can actually see the motion of individual stars, not all stars, but some stars around it. And as you can see, this is a system that, that has been observed over the course of uh, two decades at least. And you can see that all these stars are orbiting in ellipses and they all orbiting the, they're all orbiting the same point. So the focal point, they all share a focal point of whether, where we, we believe the uh, black hole is. Now, in addition to that, independently, the, uh, people have also uh, detected radio signals coming from the same from the same point, uh, indicating that there's some uh, there's something special about this about this uh, location. Now, um, in 2013, there was another object that was found close to the galactic center, and this was an effort led by uh, Vicky Caspi from from McGill, and then they, what, what, was, what they found was a special kind of star that orbits extremely close to the black hole, so much closer than any of these stars. And actually it was, um, it, it was, an, it was something called um, a magnetar. So it's, it's something that's left when, when, a, when a star explodes, but the core is not massive enough to collapse to a black hole, so it collapses to something else. So it's called a, a neutron star, and it's a special kind of a neutron star. Now, because it's, uh, because it's so close, it can also be used to constrain the um, mass and velocity and the properties of, of the black hole. Uh, finally, I want to mention uh, one of the greatest achievements uh, in the last few years, and this is a direct image of a black hole. So the closest we've come, humanity has come, to taking a picture of a black hole. Um, and the problem with taking, with, with Doing this is that uh, there's this, this theorem that says that if you want to resolve, if you want to uh, see the details of something very small and far away, you need a huge lens. And actually, uh, for the for the closest black holes, you need um, a lens that is big as that is as big as the Earth. So of course we can't build um, we can't build a, a glass lens that's so that's so big. But when you observe in the radio, there's a trick that you can use. And basically, you can you can connect a different radio observatory across the Earth, and by some sort of um, mathematical magic, you can you can combine all the, the data from all of them to to effectively form a huge camera the size of the Earth. And this is something that uh, and this and this produced um, this image of the black hole from M87, a nearby galaxy. And again, what you see here is not the black hole itself, but the hot material material that's spiral, spiraling around it. Now this is something that has been led by, um, this effort was led by Avery Broderick from Perimeter Institute and Wayne Penn from the University of Toronto was also involved in this process. Um, so finally, finally, I wanna talk about um, another kind of uh, way to, to find uh, nearby black holes, and this is called a pulsar timer ring. This is the method that I think is is uh, the most out there of all the other methods. So, first of all, I should explain that this method uses uh, pulsars, which are special kinds of very dense objects um, 
And what's special about them is that they have regular pulses. So you can think about them like lighthouses. So they have the, these beams and whenever the beam uh, is pointed at us, we see a, a burst and whenever it's pointing away, we don't see anything. And the, they're extremely regular. Uh, so you can use them as very, uh, very precise clocks. And they're scattered all around us, around the galaxy. Now the idea is that if we can observe all of them, if, if there's a, a gravitational wave that's passing uh, through the galaxy, then it's going to cause the time from the signals to the, the arrival time of, of the signals to change a little bit. And if you can find correlations between the arrival time of different um, of different pulsars, then you can actually measure these these gravitational waves. So by observing all of these pulsars, um, it's in effect as as though we're using a gravitational wave detector that's uh, that nature has given us. Uh, and this effort is um, is led by uh, many groups across the world and in Canada. Uh, Vicky Caspi from McGill and, and uh, Ingrid Stas from uh, UBC are, are heavily involved in this effort. So to summarize, um, black holes are not, uh, as they're portrayed in, in sci-fi and movies, but they're not less interesting. And they're a natural consequence of, of uh, natural processes. And they're out there in the galaxy and they're observed on a natural basis uh, by astronomers all around the world. Uh, and there's still many things we can learn about them. Uh, so I'll stop here and take questions if there are any. Yes, hi, thank you very much. Um, first question, yes. I have two. Uh, when a planet is near the black hole and it's gathering the matter, is it there because, or a star, I'm just sorry, is it there because of some gravitational pull to begin with? So maybe I should have mentioned it earlier, but most of the stars in our galaxy are in binaries. So the, they uh, are in binary systems where they orbit each other. Uh, the sun is a kind of an, um, well, I shouldn't say rare, but it's, it's the less common case where, where, where you have just a single, when you have just a single star. So in most cases, when we see um, actually binaries, uh, it's usually thought that uh, they started out as a binary, and then one of them turned into a black hole and then got closer to the other one. Okay, all right. And my other question was, you mentioned about the energy that is emitted from a black hole. Yes. Are we, is there a way or are we working on a way to harness some of that energy? Um, so this energy, so the energy is released in a, in a so, this energy is released at an extremely low rate. So I've done the calculation a while ago. And um, if you, so if you take, so the, the smaller, the smallest the black hole, the, the more energy that you get. Now let's take the smallest black hole around. So the smallest black hole that we know is about three times the mass of, um, three times the mass of the sun. Now, if you collect all the energy that it, it's emitting throughout the lifetime of the universe, you get uh, about the same energy that, that the sun produces when it fuses four, at, four um, hydrogen atoms into one helium. So it's a tiny, tiny amount of energy. Mm. So, there's, so it's, it's barely measurable. It's not something that, it's not something that I think would be uh, measurable uh, anytime. Okay. And the only reason when that we, we're confident about it, and I can, I can um, Talk a little, about, little bit about this more, but uh, the only reason that we're confident is that there are ex lab experiments that simulate some of the aspect of black holes, and then we see that, and we see the radiation there. But then it's very contrived, and there are arguments of how much does the analogy, how much of the analogy carries over when you talk about black holes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, if not, then I can, um, I can show some of the uh, slides that I reserved in case there's some free time. Um, so coming back to the, to the topic of, um, of stuff that's coming out of a black hole, I've made some, uh, some slides that demonstrate what exactly is happening when, uh, when, when we say that stuff can get out of uh, black holes or that it can emit radiation. Um, so 
to understand this, one way of understanding what's going on in there is um, by understanding the topic of quantum tunneling. And this sounds very bombastic, but um, it's something that's very easy to understand. So con consider these two experiments, the, uh, this experiment. So suppose that you have this um, block of, let's say, glass or some transparent material, and you shine a laser through. Then, right? Here, nothing special happens, and you just see um, you just see a light spot on the other side. Now, imagine that you cut it in half, and you displace one of the halves. So here, what would happen is that the light would be reflected. Now, this is an effect. This is um, now so far nothing special has, has happened. This is something that uh, we see all the time. So, for example, if you think about um, if, if you've ever been, if you ever have been underwater and you look up, then right, you see the, the surface of the water, the water beyond a certain angle looks like it's um, like a mirror. Or if you've uh, if you've stared, if if you put your head uh, next to the bottom of uh, of an aquarium and you look up, then the um, uh, the surface of the water looks like a like a mirror. So the same thing happens here; the light gets reflected. But when you move them close enough, some of the light does hop across this gap and makes it to the other side. And this is in a way um, the same as, um, the same principle as quantum tunneling. So um, what happens in quantum tunneling is that you have a particle on, on one side of a barrier and um, it doesn't have enough energy to climb the barrier, but uh, it has enough energy to be on the other side. So there's some probability of crossing this barrier, even though it's not supposed to be able to do that. Um, and you can think about Hawking radiation. You can think about radiation that's coming from a black hole as particle that manage. So classically, they can't do it because, as we, as we said, you can't get, you can't um, uh, leave the black hole. But because of this effect, there's um, there's a way for uh, one particle at a time to try and and leave the black hole, to, to jump across this gap and uh, and make it outside. But again, because the, um, but again, this effect exists, but it's extremely weak. weak. Uh, so it does happen, but at a very slow rate. Um, and how how do we um, how do we experiment with this? So one design, one uh, kind of experiment people do is uh, with they produce these vortices in in um, water tubs. And what's special about this vortex is that um, inside inside water you have all sorts of waves. That can travel back and forth, and the, they're analogous to light waves that can propagate out in space. Now, uh, inside this vortex, there's a certain region where the um, velocity of the water is faster than the than the waves. So, certain waves beyond the sun, they can't they can't come back from um, from beyond a certain a, a certain point, which is an, analogous to the uh, to the horizon. Now. In these experiments, people, but but these experiments are something that you can you can probe, you can you can measure stuff. And people, uh, when they um, when they establish this vortex, they are able to measure um, waves that are similar, well, or the same uh, spectrum, the same kind of wave that you'd expect if this were a black hole. So they do something that's coming out, and it's it behaves the same way as, as you'd expect Hawking radiation to uh, to behave. So um, this is the reason why we're confident that um, even though we, we, we've never measured it and probably never will measure uh, this kind of radiation, um, that, that it does exist. And also it means that um, even though the probability is very low, the, um, so it's not that um, if you fall into a black hole, this is probably not the, it's, it's not uh, a permanent situation. The, it's not that you lock there forever. There is there is uh, some way of, of getting out, but it's but the probability is extremely low, and it takes an, a huge amount of time for this to happen. Anyway, this is all of um, I've prepared for today. <laughs>